Happy Halloween, everybody. Today we're covering a topic many people find absolutely terrifying, and that's physics. Today, we're gonna to take a look at how you can use Blender's built-in physics simulations, which are really powerful and awesome animation tools for things like clothing, and integrate them into your workflow for sculpting miniatures. To follow along with this tutorial, you're gonna to need to know how to do some basic mesh manipulation, so editing and moving things around in the vertex level, and at least have a basic understanding of the sculpting tools available to you in Blender. This guy is a fairly simple model, not very artistic, so it's actually also a very good starting point for sculpting if you're kind of new to that. But you do got to know how to use those tools to accomplish just basic sculpting stuff. So with those few details out of the way, let's dive in and take a look at the tutorial for creating this little Grim Reaper Wraith thing. Even though our final character is just going to be this haunted cloak floating there, in order for the cloth simulation to work correctly, it needs to have something to interact with. Therefore, our very first step is going to be to build a very rough body shape of the ghost that's wearing the cloak. Here's the completed rough character model. As you can see, it's very, very rough. Now this is about the level of detail you need to get for this tutorial. I'm not even worrying about things like proportions. I mean, the arms are probably different lengths, so are the legs. That's fine. This is really just a box model for the cloak to interact with. But one last thing before we start working on the clothing is I need to apply a subdivision surface modifier to the character to give it some more of a curve shape instead of a box shape. So let's just jump over here to our modifiers properties on the right hand side. We're going to choose subdivision surface under generate. And all right, we're just going to go ahead, let's do viewport two. And then what I'm probably need to do now that I've got some curves here, I'm going to go back in, edit them a little bit and make the proportions a little bit better in terms of basically making the limbs a little bit bigger because this process reduces the size down. So let me do that. And then we'll be ready to add some clothing to the character. Alright, I refine the model just a little bit to give some more proportions to things. Now it's time to make the rough shape of the cloak. And kind of like how this was made with just a very rough mesh, we're going to do the same thing with the cloak. This time we're going to start with the cylinder. So let me add one of those and then the lower left hand corner here. I'm going to drop it down to 16 vertices because I just want a very low res thing for this process. And then I am going to jump into wireframe mode, jump into edit mode. I'm going to delete the top set of vertices. And then down here in the bottom, I want to delete only faces. So press X and choose only faces. So all you've got left down here is a ring. I'm going to position this guy down near the ghost's feet. And then I'm going to basically very roughly model the shape of the cloak around his body as it moves upward and then we'll worry about applying the cool physics to it. So as I build up the sleeves here, there's one important detail I need to pay attention to. I want to make sure that the number of basically segments or loops the sleeves are built out of is the same for the left and the right. So right here I've extruded one loop. I want to keep a count of that so that when I go to work on the other side of the body, I have the same number of extruded loops along this arm as well. Now there are a few more quick steps you have to do before we approach the cloth simulation. One, you want to make sure that your cloak here, basically that all the areas that would be open on a cloak are open, so the bottom, sleeve holes, and the face. So this is definitely a non-manifold mesh you're working with. Next, I want to actually make a copy of my character in here, so I'm just going to do Shift D and immediately click off. So now I've got cube, which, okay, that's a terrible name. Let's call this guy um, 
ghost body. <laughs> and then the other one will be also the ghost body.001. I'm going to hide my ghost body copy, and the reason for that is I'm going to apply my subdivision surface. However, I may need to come back and change this character a little bit to make the cloth simulation work a little bit more in my favor. So therefore I have the easy to modify version of this mesh that I can fall back to if I need to. Now we're going to go back to our cloak thing here, which I gave it a little bit more useful name as you can see here. I'm going to make a copy of this as well. And then let's hide it. During this process, I'm going to be doing some very big steps, as you see, first to the model and now to the cloak, to these items. And it's just easier to make a copy of them at this point, so in case i got to roll back for any reason, I've got a previous copy of it. So with the one that's still visible, let's select it, go into Edit Mode, and then have everything selected in Vertex Mode, and we're going to subdivide it twice. This just gives us some more detail and more vertices for the cloth simulation to work with. All right, now here comes the interesting part. Cloth simulation is under the physics tab over here. It's a little orbit looking thing. So let's click on that. And we're going to turn on cloth for the cloak. And then we got to go back to our character, click on him. And in his physics tab, we want to turn on collision. Therefore, the cloak can interact with the collision object. Now, when it comes to any of these physics simulations, there's tons of details. Lots of stuff you can do. This is a very simple approach to learn just how you can kind of use this to cheat a little bit with the modeling process for miniatures. Uh, so the one thing I'm going to change is vertex mass at the moment. I'm going to drop that to 0.1 kilograms. We may go back and bump that up. We'll see how things look. Now for cloth simulations by default, we can actually work with the animation timeline, which is something we don't normally use in 3D printing. So for start, have frame 1. For end, let's click there, type 100. Make sure this box here, which is your current frame, is set to 1. Let's save it and press space and see what happens. Weird things might happen. And we'll just let it run for 100 frames and see how it looks. All right, that looks all right. I'm going to take my current frame and jump to 100. And it's not bad. This may not be exactly what you want, but you get certain effects you see. Like you got his sleeves just kind of dangling down like this. The hood is kind of sliding backwards, which is one of those weird, odd things that could happen. And the other thing is there's not really a lot of wrinkles that you would want to see, like if he's walking and moving the cloak around. So let's see how we can fix some of these things, in particular the wrinkles and the hood. So to fix the hood, the first thing I'm going to do is jump back to our original models before we did a subdivision and before we apply the subdivision surface modifier. So let's just delete these two guys. And then bring these back. First thing I want to do is actually extend out the head a little bit. I know it's kind of odd. And then angle it down. So it's going to have kind of a funny drooping head like that. Uh, the reason for this is physics, right? So the hood is I wanted to have it fall forward and kind of fall this way off the surface of his face and hang down here a bit more and therefore counteract the fact it's going to pull backwards. So I'm kind of creating a little bit of a balancing pulley type action here with this head shape. Then with the cloak, I'm going to add another edge loop. So I'm going to extrude it out a little bit and just kind of drape it over the head so once again it has a little bit more tendency to fall forward and counteract the balance of the force wanting to pull it backwards. All right, so let's make some copies of our guys and then hide the copies off. Apply our various modifiers or in the case of our cloak here, let's subdivide it a few times. Then if we reapply the physics modifiers, jump back to frame one and we'll see what happens. The cloak is still pulling backwards a little bit, but it looks a lot better and we can fix that later anyway. So now I also want to now get a little bit more dynamic action going on with the body area and try to get some more wrinkles and fabric details and things like that you'd expect to see on a miniature that's kind of simulating movement. This is how we're going to add some more 
I guess, interesting motion to the cloak anyway. So first of all, whenever you start changing the settings over here for your cloth physics, you want to jump to frame one. So click down here, choose one. Otherwise, you might get some weird things happening. And then what we're going to do, quality steps, let's crank it up to 10. For the vertex mass, I'm going to really turn this guy up to 0.75 kilograms. Got a little bit more motion going on here. And, but, you see, uh-oh, our cloak's sliding back here, getting the hoods getting ready to fall off. But there's definitely more hints of wrinkles in the fabric and basically kind of emulating more motion. So the one thing else I want to turn on is go down and expand out collisions right here on the right hand side and choose self collisions and then just leave all these numbers over here default. And then we'll come back over here and hit play. You'll probably notice that your computer is going to chug a lot more than normal because this basically allows the cloth to collide with itself and bounce around and things like that. But it is going to, one, actually solve the problem with the hood, and to add a little bit more dynamic motion to this thing. And once your animation is run through its 100 frames, you'll notice it's going to go a lot faster. So once Blender's done its initial math, you can kind of get an idea of how things look. Now, of course, we've got an animation going on here, and it's also kind of a low poly, low res animation. So how are we going to turn this into a miniature exactly, you might wonder. So here's the catch, right? No matter how good you get with these physics animations, you're never going to be able to use them to produce a sculpted miniature. Because, as I mentioned before, details on miniatures are greatly exaggerated. So even if you got this the really cool looking animation, that detail you get in the animations not going to translate well directly to a miniature just because the detail on the animation is going to be more in proportion, more realistic, things like that. So what's going to happen here is we're going to use this animation as a base starting point for sculpting the miniature. So let's choose our starting point here and what you can do, just kind of watch your animation run through and we'll figure out what frame we want to start with. Uh, let's go there. So I have not stop on frame 60, but you know, it depends on how things are set up, whatever looks good for you. Just do a quick check to make sure there's nothing really crazy going on. Stuff like this where it's bunched up in the back, we'll fix that in a moment in the sculpting process. Before I apply this, I'm going to jump back to frame 1. I'm going to make a copy of my cloak with all the data I'm using for the cloth physics. We'll hide that out of the way. We'll jump back to frame 60, and then let's click on our cloak. And now we're going to go to the Modifiers tab. And in here, you'll notice there is a cloth modifier. This is created by the physics process. Just hit Apply, and what this will do is it will take whatever effects that the physics had done at that frame and turn them into the final mesh. Now what we have to do is jump over to Sculpt Mode in Blender. So up here in the corner, we're going to go to Sculpt Mode. And we're going to start using the Blender Sculpt tools to accentuate all the details that you see here that were generated as part of the physics. So it's a bit of a process, it's not you know, automatic, but it's essentially the physics process gives you a rough draft of your final miniature. And I'm going to go from here using traditional Blender Sculpting to actually make it into a proper gaming miniature. So it's going to be a process of bulking things up with clay strips, smoothing things out with the smooth tool, and then enhancing some details with tools like the pinch tool and the crease tool. And before I start this process, I can actually go ahead and hide my ghost character. He's no longer needed because the fact that he's already done his job, which was to create this rough draft of the final cloak. A few issues you might run into here. Even though I'm in add direction over here for the clay strips, it kind of carved the guy out. And also, you can see over here, it made an impact on his back, which I don't want it to. So let's address those two things here. Let me hit control Z to clear that up. And let me go over a few more details with the tools, how to fix that. First things we want to do is go down to our symmetry tab here and uncheck mirror X. This is a non-symmetrical character so we don't want to you know mirror at all 
The last option you want to choose is front faces only. This will also help the situation where sculpting on one side causes effects to occur on the back of the miniature. And I think that'll probably solve the drawing on his back thing. I am going to jump into edit mode and I'm going to do, sh oh boy, um, <laughs> I was going to do my shift N recalculate outside, but it doesn't know what outside is now, does it? So let's show you something kind of advanced over here. So you want to click on the um, little drop down arrow called overlays. It's next to this little, this little icon right here. And under normals, I want to click this button. This is the display normals for faces. And what you're going to see is for the most part, they're all kind of pointing inwards, right? You can see them all on the inside and they're not uh, very much on the outside. That is the cause of the issues. We want the normals to be on the outside. So to solve that, let's press A to make sure the whole object is selected. Go up to mesh, choose normals and flip. And now, therefore, everything's on the outside. If I go back to sculpt mode and start drawing, you can see it's now adding clay strips to the outside, which is what we want. All right, we'll carry on with the sculpting process to really bring out all the details. First of all, I should mention, I am using dynamic typology right now. For a one-off miniature, I can use this, create all sorts of messy geometry, and I don't really care. So for my project here, I'm thinking this looks pretty good in terms of the amount of detail I want. Eh, let me just, that was one little spot right there. Just cut my attention, freaking plan a little. There we go. <laughs> little details like that drive me crazy. Exactly how much detail you need in terms of exaggerating things. Well, I'll be honest with you. That's one of those kind of frustrating experience things. It's gonna take you a couple miniatures of just sculpting printing them off and seeing how they look and going back and forth until you can kind of get an idea of how it should look in a 3D modeling program like this. But on the topic of detail, I think I want to add one more really cool looking feature. But before we can get to that, one important thing we have to do is make this mesh manifold. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of that. That's a bit of a, well, long video in itself. I've done some videos on that link in the show notes. But what I'm going to do here is pretty much kind of chop off a end of the sleeves, the bottom, and the hood here. And we're going to kind of just fill them in and make this guy a solid object and run some tests from there. So let's do that process right now. Let's take a look at another example of how you can use physics to add some more details to our character here. Now that I've sorted out all the, oh goodness, <laughs> face issues and things. And let's wrap some chains around him. So I'm going to go a bit of Jacob Marley on him here and give him like a thing of chains that goes around this way. When it comes to animating chains in Blender, there's a wholly separate type of physics we could use, except those don't really apply to miniatures because our chains, when you're modeling that in miniatures, have to be done in a very different way. Well, a few key differences anyway, versus animating something for a movie. So I'm gonna use a cloth simulation again, but it's gonna be kind of a weird series of steps. Step one is to add a circle that approximates the length of the chain we wanna wrap around the character and position it more or less where the chain would be. So let's do Shift A, choose curve, circle, and then I'm gonna move it and shape it into position. So that looks halfway decent. I wanna convert this guy into a mesh now. So we're gonna go up to object, choose convert to mesh from curve meta surf text. And then if I click on it now, you can see it's a whole bunch of individual little points which works pretty good. 
Uh, I want to start by subdividing it. So let's subdivide it like that, get us some more vertices in there. And then I want to extrude out the faces. So let's go ahead, extrude, and make it look kind of like that, so like a ribbon almost. Move it up just a little bit back to where I want it. Now I want to make sure that it's not actually like currently overlapping any area around him, which it is not, which is good. So we're going to start by going to our character here, go to its physics tab, and we want to enable a collision physics property again because we want to have our eventual chain wrap up against his body. And then for the chain, let's do a cloth. Make sure we're on frame one. <laughs> Otherwise, that will happen where it fell down here. Um, let's add some vertex mass up there. I'm not going to worry about self collisions this time. Let's just hit animate and let it do its thing. It's probably running dog slow because our character here is like super high res. Well, that didn't quite work now, did it? Gonna hit. Let's pause the animation. Um, it's kind of falling down his shoulder, so that's not what I want. So let's go back to the start here and just kind of change up the position of this a little bit, maybe change its size. You can do things like that to give it a little bit of a different influence. And worst case scenario, you can always recreate if you think it's not going to do what you think it will do. Well, let's not hide it. There we go. Let's try that. All right, animated this time. All right, immediately pause really quickly. Because all I want to do is get it to drape around him a little bit. I don't need to do the full physics simulation. So let's go to like frame 10. I think that, that looks probably pretty good. It's hanging off. Hmm, it's hanging off down here. So what I might do, let's just do this. Let's apply our cloth simulation and I'm just gonna shrink it down a little bit and reposition it manually. Cause right now it's, I can manipulate this a little bit if I need to. This is pretty much just a placeholder. So I think that's pretty good as is. So I'm gonna jump back into edit mode. I'm gonna do a loop cut or a radial cut, whatever it's called there, and run it right down the middle like that. And then I'm gonna invert my selection. Wrong button, I always do that. And delete these guys. So all I've got left now is a single string of vertices that approximate the position of the chain. And I'm gonna very quickly model up a very large chain link. And there's a lot of ways you can do this. So I'm just gonna do one of the ways. And you want this thing to be relatively large compared to the character. Because once again, big detail, it's kind of a good thing. The reason why we can't use standard animations for Blender in terms of solid objects is because we really need our chain to actually be a solid object, which normally chains obviously have this empty inside to it. We don't really want that for miniature purposes. So I am going to do some modifications here. All right, so you've got essentially a chain with a solid core to it because we need that for 3D printing purposes. Otherwise, your life gets a little messy. Also, this particular chain link is very tall, and the reason for that is when we get around to adding this to the miniature, we need to make sure that each link is fully in contact with the body of the character. This is important for 3D printing reasons. Blender does have a set of tools we could potentially use to take this chain link we just created and wrap it around our model using the path we created a little bit ago. However, these tools are kind of finicky and things tend to go awry pretty easily and resolving those issues are a little bit difficult to explain. So today, we're just going to go ahead and manually create our chain 
following this path we created just a bit ago. So it might be easier to just actually manually add your chain links one at a time. I'm gonna start here initially with the, um, these really tall ones, and you're gonna see very quickly why that is. Let me line up the first one here, and then I'm gonna move it into the body. And the reason why they're very tall like that is as you see, as I add these chain links around where the chain should be laying, I want to make sure that they're fully in contact with the body of the miniature. You can see they're absorbed in the miniature's body like that. That's a very intentional design choice because if you don't do that, you can get some really bizarre print failures because stuff isn't attached right to the model and resin goes to hell in a handbasket. So I'm going to start by applying these chain links and essentially being half the chain around the length of this character. So there's the first set of links. Now, of course, the chain has interconnecting links to connect each of these two. That's how it stays together. So we got to add that as well. But this time we can get rid of the really tall links because we don't need that now that these pieces are anchored together. And because they have a solid core to them, there's going to be a good solid connection between those links and these links and it should minimize the risk of any sort of printing issues. So let me take one of these guys out. Let's bring it out from the miniature and see, scale it down like that. So it's a much more normal sized link. We'll rotate it 90 degrees along whatever axis that happens to be. There we go. And then we can position these where they would be to hold the chain together. I guess that brings us to the end, the blender part of this tutorial here. And I suppose the moral of the story, the short version after you've watched the whole video, is well, the physics simulations in Blender are really freaking awesome, but by themselves are not currently directly transferable to tabletop game miniature sculpting. But they can be used as excellent reference material to create, you know, a final product like this. So this point here, I'm gonna merge all this together. I'm gonna to bring in some extra bits that I've made before, turn this guy into a cool looking miniature and then 3D print him up. I'll take him over to the table, let's get him assembled and paint him up and see how he finally looks. And that brings us to the end of the show. So once again, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefields. Hopefully everyone has a happy Halloween. It's kind of a weird one this year. <laughs> if you stumble across this video at some point in the future, it's 2020, and I'm sure you probably know what that all means for usual Halloween type celebrations. But hey, hopefully things still go pretty well for you guys. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Well, that's how you know you kind of hit the wrong button somewhere. <laughs>